My name is Andrew Dean. As Lakehead University's Vice President of Research and Innovation, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the opening ceremonies for our 17th Annual Research and Innovation Week. To begin, I would like to acknowledge the original custodians of this land and pay my respect to the elders, past, present, and future, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the cultures, and the hopes of Indigenous people. I'd also like to recognize that our Thunder Bay and Aurelia campuses are on the traditional land of some of our country's Indigenous people. In Thunder Bay, we are on the traditional land of the Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850. In Aurelia, Lakehead University resides on the traditional land of the Anishinaabe people and of the Rama First Nation. I also acknowledge the history that many nations hold in these areas and look forward to respectful relations with the First Nations, Métis and Inuit in the spirit of reconciliation. I'm now pleased to say that Research and Innovation Week has officially begun. So the theme for Research and Innovation this week, this year, is planetary stewardship. Very briefly, we have defined planetary stewardship as the act of respecting and caring for our home Earth. Now, there are clearly many important and crucial events happening in our world today, but one that is certainly paramount is climate change and how we're going to change our behaviors and actions to address this crisis. Research and innovation will play a vital role as we look for new ways to obtain and distribute green energy, mitigate the impacts of climate change, and also adaptation and resilience. Many of the talks and events this week will focus on this theme, and I know it's going to be an exciting week of engaging and captivating activities. During this week, we will have over 20 different events over the five days, and through this virtual platform, we will be able to fully integrate research activities between both campuses. While all events will be stimulating, I'd like to draw your attention to a few of the highlights. Today, we will start with the keynote speaker, Seth Klein, who will speak on mobilizing Canada for the climate emergency. And tonight at 7 p.m., as part of the Science and Environmental Studies Speaker Series, we will have a talk by Dr. Rudun Talrak, who will speak on viral disease through the lens of geometry. Tomorrow, we begin with some of our student research competitions, including the graduate student three-minute thesis and the three-minute research. On Wednesday, student competitions continue with the undergraduate research conference, and in the evening, we will have, a global, have the Global Indigenous Speaker Series given by Dr. Kelsey Leonard from the University of Waterloo, who will speak on imagining a just world through Indigenous knowledge systems. Thursday, of course, is our gala event where I encourage you to dress up and really make it a gala if only from your basement or office. Throughout the week, we will be releasing three videos from the winners of the Ignite video competition. I also encourage you to watch for special appearances of our Lakehead University mascot. Prizes can be won throughout the week by collecting game codes such as hashtag Seth K and adding it to the gamification tab. Perhaps after this talk, after Seth's talk, as I understand it, you could add it, it's worth 100 points. RNI Week is about celebrating, rewarding, and appreciating research, and I hope that you're able to participate in as many events as possible. Now, I'd really like to turn this over to Dr. Moore McPherson, Vice Chancellor and President of Lakehead University. Thank you, Andy, and good morning, Buju, to everyone. And first, a sincere thank you to you, Elder Audrey DeRoy, for sharing a beautiful opening prayer and a song to provide honor and perspective as we delve into our theme of planetary stewardship. Each day is a new day to listen and learn and to find new ways to respect our home, the land, our communities, and our planet. Andy, what an exciting week there is ahead of us as we celebrate the 17th Annual Research and Innovation Week. This week will provide us an opportunity to recognize the numerous contributions from our faculty, students, and partners across both campuses. We appreciate that science and discovery is at the core of how we develop as a society and how we contribute to advancing our strategic priorities. 
our annual research and innovation week reminds us of the diversity of knowledge and of the many challenges our researchers overcome in their steady pursuit of solutions and progress. I invite you all to take part in the graduate and the undergraduate events and presentations this week and to experience the future of research and innovation as it pertains to stewarding our planet. I wish to extend everyone a warm welcome to joining us this morning from Thunder Bay, Aurelia and beyond and trust that you will all enjoy a week full of thought provoking and engaging speakers. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Lakehead University's Chancellor, Dr. Rita Shelton Deverell to join in our welcome and our opening of this year's Research and Innovation Week. Over to you, Rita. I am delighted to be asked to join in the welcome and the greetings. Thank you, President Moira, and thank you, Elder Audrey, for your wonderful opening comments. Uh, your theme couldn't be more important. You don't need me to tell you that. So I'm going to comment on your excellent choice of the persons ending the program and the person beginning the program. Um, Dr. Rita Wong is one of the ending people. And um, she has been involved in reimagining water for many years with my wonderful colleague in the Okanagan, Dr. Dorothy Christian. Um, and just a wee bit about Dorothy, she contacted me when I was at Vision TV during the Oka standoff. So that's more than 30 years ago. And she said, the women from the Okanagan are going to Oka to do peace ceremonies. Media have not been interested in peace ceremonies. I think you will be. Um, this is a moment, as you all know, where peace is very much on our minds. And now for your beginning program, uh, you'll hear a lot more about Seth Klein, I'm sure, but I wish to thank the entire Klein family for their planetary stewardship. Uh, they are making enormous contributions to a better Canada. Um, I interviewed the parents of Seth for my book, American Refugees, and the, a wonderful choice. Bring you many greetings. The topic is extremely important and crucial, and good luck in this planetary stewardship week. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chancellor Rita Sheldon Deverell. It's really wonderful to hear the personal connections there as well. Opening ceremonies is a time when we typically have special guests and dignitaries join us for, to bring words of welcome. We're very fortunate at Lakehead University to have strong relationships with our municipal, municipal, provincial, and federal government representatives. The funding we receive from government agencies truly makes a lot of the work that we do in research and innovation possible and supports many of our student researchers. I'm pleased to share a special video presentation where we'll hear from many of our government representatives, representatives and also Angela Maltese, the chair of our board of governors, who I know is a wonderful champion for Lakehead University. We're also gonna hear from Dr. Dean Jobin Bevins, who will share some highlights from the Aurelia campus. Enjoy the video. Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to join in this year's Virtual Research and Innovation Week celebration and bring greetings as the principal of Lakehead University's Aurelia campus. 
Research and Innovation Week has always been an opportunity to highlight research accomplishments across our campuses, especially amongst the community of researchers here on the Aurelia campus who have a long-standing association with community-based research. Partnerships with local not-for-profits, industry and business help to accelerate the economy and advance innovation locally. Dr. Amir Amali's current partnership with the City of Aurelia will determine the feasibility of establishing a cybersecurity cluster in our community, which has the potential of bringing new jobs and attracting new talent to the area. Dr. Gerardo Reyes, Associate Professor in the Department of Sustainability Studies, is working with Camp Hill Communities in Angus on adaptation strategies to enhance and maintain the community's maple syrup operation as our climate changes. And doctors Angela Hovey, Susan Scott, and Lori Chambers have been partnering with Interval and Transition Houses across Ontario to develop a harm reduction framework to better serve all women who need access to safe shelters. Research allows for meaningful communities and connections with the community through multiple avenues and allows us to make an impact on the communities where we live and work. I encourage you to take time this week to discover the many ways that our researchers, both here in Aurelia and in Thunder Bay, are impacting our community. I wish you all the very best and much success with Research and Innovation Week. On behalf of the citizens of Thunder Bay and my colleagues on City Council, thank you for inviting me to be part of Lakehead University's 17th Annual Research and Innovation Week. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are on the traditional territory of the Ojibwe Anishinaabe people of Fort William First Nation and the Métis peoples. The city also acknowledges that Thunder Bay is covered by the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850, signed with Fort William First Nation. It is an honor to be here for this opening, and I want to congratulate President and Vice Chancellor Dr. Moira McPherson, Vice President of Research and Innovation, Andrew Dean, and the entire team of researchers at Lakehead University for your tremendous achievements in the area of research and innovation. I'd also like to congratulate the many students and staff who also play critical roles in advancing research and innovation at our university. The work you do has made such a difference in our community in so many ways, from spin-off companies and new technology used at existing companies to supporting the social framework of our community. You contribute to and improve the quality of life for everyone in our city and in our region. Innovation is a key element in growing our local and regional economy and creating opportunities for people to find fulfilling careers and possibility for growth and development. Lakehead University is a national leader in the area of research and innovation, and we are so very fortunate to have these efforts taking place in our city. On behalf of Council, congratulations on your tremendous achievements in the area of research and innovation, which has led to a healthier, more vibrant city for the citizens of Thunder Bay. Thank you once again. And I'll read the proclamation now, March 7 to 11, 2022. Whereas Lakehead University has for more than 50 years pursued research and innovation activities in various disciplines, and whereas the Thunder Bay community in Northwestern Ontario greatly benefit from Lakehead University's various research and innovation initiatives in the social sciences, humanities, sciences and engineering and health services, and whereas Lakehead University's Research and Innovation Week celebrates the numerous accomplishments to the citizens of the community of Thunder Bay and beyond. Now, therefore, I, Bill Morrow, Mayor of the City of Thunder Bay, do hereby proclaim March 7 to 11, 2022, to be Research and Innovation Week at Lakehead University and the City of Thunder Bay, and encourage, invite all citizens to recognize and celebrate the many contributions of Lakehead University's researchers to the Thunder Bay community. Thank you all, and have a great week. Hello, bonjour, Annie. Whether you are here in Simcoe County or in Thunder Bay, thank you for joining us today. Lakehead University is a point of pride for Simcoe County, constantly growing and evolving while serving our residents through education, training, partnerships, and enhanced community spirit. It's a pleasure to join you for Research and Innovation Week, where we look to our future and build from our past. 
We've been through a tough two years. While it's been challenging, this pandemic has reminded us that by working together, we can make a huge difference. This applies to our efforts towards protecting our ecosystems. We must ensure that we are taking the time to listen to what our planet is telling us about our changing climate. That's why at the County of Simcoe, we are protecting our forests, lakes, and rivers and applying balance to every decision we make. We are not only keeping our region beautiful and safe, but also sustainable in the long term. The ability to protect our world for future generations is what makes us stronger and healthier as a society. As the next generation of leaders, I ask that you continue protecting our environment through strong research and innovation. I can't wait to see what you'll accomplish both here in Simcoe County and around the world. Thank you, merci, miigwech. Hi there, Steve Clark, Mayor of the Sunshine City here. And I'd like to take this opportunity to applaud Lakehead students and faculty for their extensive research conducted over the years on a variety of topics. With this year's Research and Innovation Week focusing on the most timely and critical issue of planetary stewardship, I truly look forward to seeing some of the fruits of this work. Now is the time to act and protect our planet for generations to come. Thank you for this. Merci miigwech. Hello. I'm Adam Chambers, the Member of Parliament for Simcoe North and the home of the Aureli campus of Lakehead University, located on the traditional lands of the Fort William First Nation. Congratulations on your Research and Innovation Week. This is an excellent time to be talking about planetary stewardship. We are at an important crossroads for our communities and globally. In many ways, science, through the development of vaccines, has got us through the worst of this pandemic. It's research and innovation that constantly propels society forward. We need to listen, learn, explore, and act. We can think globally and act locally to make our communities and world a better place. Have a great week. Hello and welcome to the official opening of Research and Innovation Week at Lakehead University. You've always made research and innovation an absolute top priority, which is, which is evidenced by the fact that you were consistently ranked as one of the top research universities in your class. So, so hats off for that achievement. And uh, your theme this year of planetary stewardship is an important one. There's no doubt that climate change has, has made a real difference in how we have to look at the world. And I think research and innovation can be the real key to making a difference. So we applaud you for that as well. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful week. Hello everyone. I'm so pleased to be part of Lakehead University's 17th Research and Innovation Week. This year's topic, planetary stewardship, could not be more timely. As we all know, our planet is in crisis and we all need to do more to ensure a sustainable future. When I meet with stakeholders in my role as critic for the Ministry of Natural Resources, Forestry and Mines, they often cite the good work that's already happening at Lakehead University. So I congratulate all those involved. Thank you to Dr. McPherson and Dr. Dean for their ongoing work. And I look forward to the week ahead. Take care everyone and stay safe. Hi, I'm Jill Dunlop, Ontario's Minister of Colleges and Universities. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we've all seen the critical importance of research, science, and innovation. Whether it is finding a vaccine for COVID-19 or creating new technologies to assist healthcare providers, our researchers and scientists are continuing to make new discoveries that demonstrate the strength of Ontario's research and innovation sector. The incredible work happening at our province's post-secondary institutions, including Lakehead University, is often the launching ground for major advancements. Ontario will continue to support research and innovation so we can help solve the complex problems facing us today. Post-secondary students are our future researchers and innovators, so it's great that you have the opportunity to attend events like this one. With the theme this year of planetary stewardship, I encourage you all to contribute your talent to the important global efforts of protecting our planet for future generations to come. Hi everyone, I'm Angie Maltese, Chair of Lakehead University's Board of Governors. I'm very pleased to be able to participate in Lakehead University's 2022 Research and Innovation Week. I've been reflecting personally on what this year's theme, 
planetary stewardship means for me. I've been envisioning a better path forward, one where we develop different forms of transportation to renewable energy sources. We each have a responsibility to care for our planet. I am sure that many of you were as proud as I was when in the fall of 2020, Lakehead University's Board of Governors voted unanimously to divest fully from Lakehead University's fossil fuel holdings by the end of our strategic plan in 2023. This was a big commitment and we are well underway to achieving that goal. Furthermore, recently, Lakehead University adopted steps to become a signatory to the Investing to Address Climate Change Charter, a pledge by Canadian universities to adopt a responsible investing framework, amongst other commitments. And this year, Lakehead University declared the current academic year as the Year of Climate Action. It called upon students, staff and faculty to identify what they could do to address climate change, everything from art, workshops, panel discussions and more. I invite all of you to participate in this week's events to explore more on what planetary stewardship means for you. Thank you and have a great week. I'd like to thank all of our special guests for providing virtual greetings. Your sincere messages really help build enthusiasm and excitement for the week ahead. That brings our opening ceremonies to a close. And we're going to move right into our keynote talk with Seth Klein. Seth Klein is the team lead for the Climate Emergency Unit, a project of the David Suzuki Institute. Previously, Seth served for 22 years as the founding British Columbia Director of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, a public policy research institute committed to social, economic and environmental justice. He is a writer, speaker and policy consultant and an adjunct professor with Simon Fraser University's Urban Studies Program. He writes a bi-monthly column for Canada's National Observer. Seth is a founder and served for eight years as co-chair of the British Columbia Poverty Reduction Coalition, a co-founder of the Metro Vancouver Living Wage for Families campaign, and an advisory board member for the Columbia Institute Centre for Civic Governance. He also serves on the board of Dogwood, British Columbia's largest nonpartisan citizen action network. Today, Seth will be speaking to us on mobilizing Canada for the climate emergency which is very much based on his recent book, A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency, which was published in September 2020 and can be obtained from any bookstore or directly from his website listed in the chat. His talk will be followed by a question and answer period. Please join me in welcoming Seth Klein. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Andy. Thank you, uh, Audrey and Moira and Rita. Um, and thank you, all of you, for your interest in joining me. And, and really thanks to Lakehead University for the honor of being asked to give today's lecture. And congratulations and thank you to all of you for making the climate emergency a focus of your year of action and this week of programming. I think that, that you are seeking to determine how your university can exercise leadership on this task of our lives is, is really most welcome. And uh, you will see, uh, with apologies to you folks in Aurelia, that Thunder Bay, where many of you are, and your city's role in World War II actually has a special connection to my book. And, and consequently, I have some very specific, maybe even provocative ideas for you all as you contemplate the role of Lakehead University and how you deploy your research and innovation and teaching expertise as we contemplate how to meet this moment. Uh, I'm joining you with gratitude from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, otherwise known as Vancouver. And as Andy said, I, I'm going to be uh, drawing today upon my, my book that came out a little over a year ago, A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. I'm going to speak for about 35 minutes and then I'm I'm looking forward to a spirited Q&A uh, period with you all as well. So 
This past year has really been one of our reckoning with the climate emergency, especially in my province of British Columbia. Uh, first, it was the extreme heat dome event that shattered temperature records in June and robbed us of almost 600 of our fellow British Columbians in less than a week. That's about as quarter, about a quarter as as many as died in British Columbia from COVID in the entire pandemic. And I wanna drive home this point. That, that June heat dome event was the most deadly weather event in Canadian history. I, I don't think we've totally gotten our heads around this. And most of those who perished were isolated lower income seniors and it was preventable. If their homes had already been unplugged from gas and converted to electric heat pump systems, which also cool in the summer, as we urgently need to do to lower our greenhouse gas emissions from our buildings, very likely every one of those people would still be with us. And that was followed by hundreds of wildfires and forced evacuation of thousands of people from their homes, most dramatically, the burning of the entire town of Lytton to the ground. Elsewhere in the country, it was flooding and drought. Uh, more recently, last November, it was mudslides and flooding in my province caused by a rolling atmospheric rivers, a new word in our climate crisis lexicon, which drowned about 650,000 farm animals, again forced over 17,000 people from their homes, whole, whole towns flooded again, caused billions of dollars in damage and wrecked havoc with vital public infrastructure. Look, many of us are wrestling with growing feelings of grief and anxiety as we witness these unfolding disasters. Seems like we're, we emerge from one crisis and stumble into the next, you know, out of the frying pan, into the fire. And paradoxically, it's, it, it's like we mobilize to put fires out and not yet to prevent them. And when these events happen, there's a tendency in the media to describe them as the new normal. They're not. They are... I'm afraid, but a taste of things to come. And for all of you who thought the last two years of pandemic living was disruptive, I'm afraid you ain't seen nothing if we don't get serious about the climate crisis. Because as disruptive as COVID was, at no time in Canada did it upend our food and water systems the way the climate crisis now is and will. And as anxiety producing as the pandemic was, it didn't have the physical effects that extreme heat does. Remember in the early days of the pandemic, you know, when we gathered to bang pots and pans at seven o'clock in the evening, like mo most of us became our best selves. But extreme heat messes with our brains, you know, it, it, and our, with our capacity to cope just when we most need to be our best selves. And then last August and again last week, as if we needed any more proof, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, 200 plus of the world's top climate scientists offered up yet more terrifying warnings that we are on borrowed time. Now, last week's IPCC report didn't get the attention it deserved, forced off the front pages by the horrors of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, yet another reminder that fossil fuels are not only a poison to our atmosphere and land and water, but also to our politics and democracy and peace. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called last week's IPCC report an atlas of human suffering, and he called out world governments for what he termed, and I quote, a criminal abdication of leadership. This report at over 3,000 pages catalogs the likely impacts of climate change, particularly on vulnerable communities. It found that over 3.3 billion people, a sizable share of humanity, are at high risk of experiencing severe impacts and dislocation in the coming decades. The numbers grow with each fraction of a degree of temperature rise, disproportionately hitting people on the, in the global south. But as we are seeing, we in wealthy countries like Canada are by no means immune. So make no mistake, folks, we indeed confront an emergency. And if we fail to act quickly, then over the course of the coming decades, things get very grim, a world that is unlivable and catastrophic for many, deeply uncomfortable and disruptive for all others, and quite possibly ungovernable. So it's an ecological crisis, but, and I wanna emphasize this point, it is just as equally a human and social justice crisis and a civilizational threat. And for all of the, you who are teachers at this university, and those of you who are students, this crisis will be the defining issue facing you and your students for the rest of their lives. 
you need to be thinking and learning together about what it will mean for their futures and careers and how you cope, they cope and adapt and, and, and how together we confront this crisis. But that's the last of the scary news that you're gonna hear from me today. Instead, for all of you feeling like me, deeply anxious, let me offer two reflections from my study of emergencies, my book study of the Second World War and our shared experience now of the pandemic and this period of climate emergency, two observations that I hope provide some solace. The first is these, is this, all emergencies start with a period of denial. All emergencies start with a period of denial. But then my second observation is that at some point, some sort of alchemy occurs, a special combination of events and leadership that shifts the popular zeitgeist and moves us into emergency mode. And then these emergencies once recognized transform us. They transform our society, our social relations, our economy, our leaders. So think on these three crises, right? Think about Canada at the brink of the Second World War. Both the public and leadership were in denial. Despite Canada's war declaration in September of 1939, it's worth recalling that even as the winds of war gathered in the late 1930s, our leaders were reluctant to recognize what would ultimately be necessary. And even once war was declared, Historian Jack Brannenstein describes the early months as one where Canada wanted to prosecute what he termed a limited liability war. And historians dubbed the first nine months of the war the phony war. And it, it strikes me that if you would ask Canadians in 1938, you know, this gang in Mackenzie King's cabinet, do they have what it takes to completely transform Canadian society and the economy as was about to happen? I'm certain most Canadians would have said, no, not this gang. And they had no reason to believe otherwise. You know, the same group had done very little right through 10 years of the depression. But then that alchemy of events and leadership events like the fall of France, but also leadership that shifted the public. And then think about COVID. Remember, as we first started to hear about this new virus a little over two years ago, we were all in denial, weren't we? About how it was about to upend our lives. But then that alchemy of events and leadership. I don't know what you remember in, in those events. I, I remember when they canceled the NBA season. Now, I don't even watch basketball, but I remember thinking, whoa, that's different. But also, I remember seeing our prime minister in front of his house each morning. That communicated something, too. That shifted the public. And similarly, you know, if you had asked me just a few months earlier, are there people at Finance Canada and the Bank of Canada capable of quickly pivoting in the space of a few weeks and creating these audacious new programs like the CERB and the wage subsidy, you know, I would have said, no, there's no one home who thinks that way. And I would have been wrong. And with this new war, again, we're seeing a reminder of the speed and scale that is possible, the, the commandeering of supply chains, the freezing of the assets of the oligarchs, the swift action with allies, the divesting of holdings, all of these things that we're told are impossible or impractical all become possible when an emergency is recognized. But then we come to the climate emergency. And at some level, we're almost all still in some state of denial, aren't we? Not yet ready to leap into this grand transition and certainly our political and business leaders are also, for the most part, still in denial. I, I want to I be clear about what I mean by that. Not in denial about the reality of human-induced climate change, not in the main, but in denial about what confronting it actually requires. We're all making our futile little bargains with the laws of nature. You know, please, just a little more time with this vehicle, or one more trip, or just a few more barrels of oil, or my personal favorite, please just let us have this pipeline and we'll use the money to fund the transition. The alchemy's first ingredient, the transformative events, those are already occurring. That's what these extreme weather events are, these attacks on our soil. But the alchemy's second ingredient, the leadership, it's not yet there. But look, so it was in 1939. Canada was on the cusp of being completely transformed by its Second World War experience, yet right up to the 11th hour, our government and most of the public still hope to avoid getting dragged into that fight. And so we find ourselves in this similar awkward period today. You know, I think this is the time of our phony war, where two summers ago, the federal government passes a climate emergency motion in the House of Commons one day, and then proceeds with reapproving the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion the very next day, 
this is a dynamic I call the new climate denialism at play. It's a concept I unpack in the book. But as with the Second World War, I am convinced that this phony war period will not last, that it is indeed about to end. I hope and believe that my book calls on us to adopt an entirely new and different approach to the crisis than the one that we've pursued to date. The, the book endeavors to tell the truth about the severity of the crisis we face, but I've also been gratified that for the most part, people are finding it a, an unusually hopeful book, notwithstanding the, the dire subject matter. And the original twist, as the title suggests, and as has been alluded to, is that the book is structured entirely around lessons from the Second World War. Now, there is, by the way, no small irony in me coming to this framework that I'm invoking. And I want to acknowledge that, like many of you, I'm sure, I also wrestle with this war analogy. My, my own political activism started as a teenager in the peace and disarmament movement in the 1980s. Moreover, I, I'm the child of Vietnam War resistors, as, uh, as Rita was alluding to. Indeed, that is how I happen to be Canadian. But despite that history, I am now strongly of the view that climate breakdown requires a new mindset to mobilize all of society and galvanize our politics and to fundamentally remake our economy. And why do I think we need a, a new approach? I wanna, I wanna call up a chart to show you what I mean. There, I hope you're seeing that. This slide shows Canada's greenhouse gas emissions going back the last 20 years, with a little hat tip to Greta Thunberg, who uh, aptly describes the climate promises to date as so much blah, blah, blah. Let this chart sink in. What you basically see there is a flat line, right? Our, our greenhouse gas emissions up and down, up and down a bit, but effectively plateaued at an historic high. To put this in the language we now all know so well from the pandemic, we have failed to bend the curve. In short, we are not on a path to stave off a horrific future for our kids and future generations. We have run out the clock with distracting debates about incremental changes. And where it matters most, actual GHG emissions, we have accomplished precious little. And so here we all are staring down this harrowing gap between what the science says we urgently have to do and what our politics seems willing and capable of entertaining. And somehow we have to kickstart something new. Now, I didn't plan on writing a war story. Um, my book project began as an exploration for how we can align our politics and economy in Canada on the one hand with what the science says we urgently need to do. And the book is that. But in the original book outline, there was only gonna be a single chapter on lessons from the Second World War because I'd long been intrigued by the war as an example of rapid economic transformation. But as I delved into that research, I began to see more and more parallels, not just on the economic front, between our wartime experience and the current crisis, and ultimately decided to structure the whole book around those wartime lessons. Because I see in that history, this helpful and in fact, hopeful reminder that we have done this before, we have mobilized in common cause across class and race and gender to confront an existential threat. And in doing so, we have retooled our entire economy twice, in fact, once, once to ramp up military production, another time to reconvert to peacetime, all in the space of six years. So the book explores what wartime scale climate mobilization could actually mean and look like, and each chapter jumps back and forth in time between stories of what Canada did in the war and what we now face. And landing on that World War II structure, it didn't merely give me an, uh, a good narrative hook, you know. It also jolted my own thinking about emergencies. I've worked on the climate file for two decades, but it made me look at it through fresh eyes, through the lens of emergency. And I feel like in this historic excavation, I. It helps to liberate our imagination and our sense of possibility. And it also becomes, and I've really appreciated this as, as I've been out in the world with the book and giving talks, and it becomes an invitation for various constituencies and for our leaders to think about the leaders who saw us through the Second World War, that previous existential threat, these people we admire. And to say to ourselves, here we are again, and who do we want to be? Ever since I released my book and started giving talks, invariably the question would come up, but how do you know when a government actually gets the emergency? 
And in seeking to answer that question, I, it forced me to distill this 400 page book into what I now call my four markers of emergency. They're a framework that my team and I now employ at the Climate Emergency Unit. And so there are four markers, and I'm about to show them to you, for when you know that a government has genuinely shifted into emergency mode. Now, they were written for mainly federal and provincial governments in mind, uh, but also municipal governments. But they actually apply just as much to any large institution, an economic sector, a crown corporation, a union, a pension fund, a faith institution, and a post-secondary institution. So let me show you what those four markers look like. Are you seeing the whole uh, four markers there? Or are they cut off? Yep, we can see it. Great. So here are the four markers of when you know that a government is in emergency mode or any large institution. It, number one, it spends what it takes to win. Number two, it creates new institutions to get the job done. Number three, it shifts from voluntary and incentive-based policies to mandatory measures as needed. And number four, it tells the truth. It tells the truth about the severity of the crisis and communicates a sense of urgency about the, necessary, the measures necessary to combat it. Now, during the Second World War, the Canadian government did all of these things. And likewise, in response to the, the pandemic, it, at least in that first year, feels like our governments passed all four markers. But with respect to the climate emergency, and so far at least, neither our federal government nor any provincial government of any political stripe, by the way, it's not just that they're missing some of the four markers, they fail to hit any of the four markers. So I wanna explore each of these four markers with you, along with a couple other key lessons from the Second World War. But I also wanna think with you a bit about how they might apply to your university. So marker number one, spend what it takes to win. See, a benefit of an emergency mentality is that it forces governments out of an austerity mindset. Remember in the first year of the pandemic, in response to the COVID emergency, Canada spent so much that the debt to GDP ratio went from about 30% to about 50% in a single year. Now that's a big jump in a single year, still pales in comparison to the war. We ended World War II with a debt to GDP rate ratio well in excess of 100%. And when C.D. Howe, C.D. Howe was the minister in the Mackenzie King government who oversaw Canada's wartime military production. And when he was pressed about this extraordinary ramp up in spending, he famously replied, if we lose the war, nothing will matter. And in order to finance that war effort, the government issued new public victory bonds and new forms of progressive taxation were instituted, including, by the way, a cap on profits. The kind of profiteering that we have seen in this pandemic was illegal in the Second World War. As we confront the climate emergency, financing the transformation before us, I think, is going to require that we employ similar tools. However, Federal spending on climate action and green infrastructure pales in comparison to both the war and the pandemic. Let me give you one example. That whole first year of the pandemic, the Bank of Canada was buying up federal government securities in order to finance the CERB and the wage subsidy and the other emergency response, was buying up federal government securities to the tune of $5 billion a week. In comparison, Trudeau government spending on the climate emergency amounts to about five to $7 billion a year. So the, our government isn't merely spending a little less than it should on the face of the climate emergency. It's probably spending less by about a tenfold order of magnitude than it should. But what might this emergency marker mean for a post-secondary institute like Lakehead? Is an appropriate share of your institution's budget being allocated to the emergency, particularly your capital budget for buildings, charging infrastructure, converting vehicle fleets to electric, transit access? Does the spending align with the reality of the emergency or is it incongruous? And importantly, this marker isn't only about spending what it takes to win, it's also about ceasing spending and investing on the things that spell ruin for our kids and grandkids. And that means governments need to stop subsidizing fossil fuels, but it also means that pensions and university endowments need to divest holdings from fossil fuel companies and their enablers, which is why I, I'm thrilled to hear in the introduction there that Lakehead University has already made that commitment. Fantastic. Uh, you know, those, those fossil fuel holdings aren't just a, 
a risk, a legal risk and a financial risk. I think in taking this action, what you have done is actually recognize a much deeper intergenerational justice matter that is at play. Because by continuing to hold these fossil fuel companies and pension portfolios and university endowments, those institutions are effectively betting against our kids and your students. If the bet wins, it's only because they lose. They will have staked their future returns on a future in which those young people reside in a hellscape. And of course, that's not why you're in this. Marker number two, create the economic institutions needed to get the job done. During World War II, starting from a base of virtually nothing, the Canadian economy and its labor force pumped out a volume of military equipment that is simply mind-blowing. During those six years, Canada, with a population less than a third what it is today, produced 800,000 military vehicles, more than Germany, Italy, and Japan combined. 16,000 military aircraft, ultimately building the fourth largest air force in the world at the time. Here in my province, you know, where we struggle these days to build a single BC ferry, we produced over 300 ships, again, from a base of virtually nothing. And remarkably, the Canadian government, under the leadership of C.D. Howe, established, in order to expedite the, the, all of that activity, established 28 crown corporations to meet that task. How I became fascinated with Howe as, the, as a figure in the book. You know, he was no lefty, by the way, just to be clear. But he was seized with the task, happy to give contracts to the private sector, but he was in a hurry. And any time the private sector couldn't quickly do what needed doing, he created another crown enterprise. His department undertook detailed economic planning, you know, uh, coordinating all of the key supply chains in order to ensure that wartime production was prioritized. And here, by the way, is where Thunder Bay makes a special appearance in this wartime history. Because how? This remarkable fellow who was so critical to the wartime mobilization was, for 22 years, the MP for what is now Thunder Bay. Also, the, the Can Car and Foundry Company, Can Car, as it was known, the, their plant in what is now Thunder Bay landed the contract to build the Hawker Hurricane fighter plane. Now, uh, that plane was key to the war. The production of the hurricanes occurred under the direction of Chief Engineer Elsie McGill from my town of Vancouver. She was then only 33 years old, the first female aeronautical engineer in Canada. McGill became something of a national superstar. There was even a, a comic about her. By the end of the war, that plant in your town had produced 1,450 plants. But sadly, in response to the climate emergency, we've seen nothing of this sort. In contrast to C.D. Howe's wartime creations, the Trudeau government has established two new crown corporations during its time in office, the Canada Infrastructure Bank, and I hate to tell you the second one, it's the Trans Mountain Pipeline Corporation. It's the one that makes us all the proud owners of a 60-year-old oil pipeline from Alberta to my province. If our governments really saw the climate emergency as an emergency, it would, like C.D. Howe did, quickly conduct an inventory of our conversion needs and determine how many heat pumps and solar arrays and wind farms and electric buses, etc., we're going to need to electrify virtually everything and end our reliance on fossil fuels. And then it would establish a new generation of public corporations to ensure those items are manufactured and deployed at the requisite scale. But here again, are universities creating new climate programs to meet this moment in every faculty? Is Lakehead ramping up the training that will be needed to transition our economy in every domain? Are you, are you recruiting students for that? Does it feel like your educational institution is all about the speed and scale of this moment? And if I may, allow me to, I wanna propose a specific new institution idea for you folks. One that would build upon Thunder Bay's wartime legacy. What if Lakehead University had a special engineering center? Maybe you could call it the, the C.D. Howe, L.C. McGill Climate Engineering School or something like that. Howe was also an engineer, by the way, by trade. And given L.C. McGill's groundbreaking work in women's rights in Canada, and, and sadly, given the shameful legacy of some of those World War II crown corporations and poisoning Indigenous lands, what if that school had a special focus on training women and Indigenous people in the mass production of electric heat pumps or some other zero carbon technology? you could make a lasting national contribution. Again, a new generation legacy. Just a thought for your consideration. Or imagine a new institution like a youth climate corps 
in the war from a population of about 11 million Canadians, over a million of them enlisted. It's remarkable, eh? And stunningly, 64% of them were under the age of 21, like most of your students. And those young people left their farms, they delayed their careers, they deferred their university studies because the emergency was in that moment. What if we had a youth climate core that said to every graduating high school student in the land, if you wanna spend the next two years meeting this moment or join a special university program that is a combination of in-class studies and rolling up your sleeves to meet this moment, we're not asking you to delay an emergency. We're, we're asking you to enlist and thousands of young people wanna do that. Marker number three, shift from voluntary and incentive-based policies to mandatory measures. Now, as I explained earlier, for the last 20 years, Canada's greenhouse gas emissions have just flatlined. Why is that? I think a major reason is that actions taken to date have been almost entirely voluntary. We encourage change, we incentivize change, we offer rebates, we send price signals. What we have decidedly not done is actually require change. If we're gonna meet the GHG targets set out by the IPCC, we need to set clear near-term dates by which certain things will be required. For example, we would declare that it'll no longer be legal to sell new fossil fuel burning vehicles as of 2025. Or we would mandate that all new buildings will not be permitted to use natural gas or other fossil fuels for heating as of next year. We would ban fossil fuel uh, advertising by fossil fuel vehicles and gas stations. Or we'd, and we would simply say no to all new fossil fuel expansion plants. That's how we would make clear that this is serious. And again, what does this mean for your university? Are you setting clear dates for all buildings to fuel swap? Are you saying no new buildings will tie into gas? Are you changing your parking regulations? Are your cafeterias and food courts being mandated to change how they source their products in terms of what they source and how local? Are you banning fossil fuel sponsored events and curriculum materials from your institution? Marker number four, tell the truth and rally the public at every turn. See, it took leadership to mobilize the public in World War II. And if we've learned anything in this pandemic, in frequency and in tone, in words and in action, emergencies need to look and sound and feel like emergencies. And the leaders that we best remember from the Second World War were these outstanding communicators who were forthright with the public about the gravity of the crisis and yet still managed to impart hope. Their messages were amplified by a news media that knew what side of history it wanted to be on and, and, and by arts and, and entertainment sector keen to rally the public. And look, that's what we've seen our government's model in the pandemic, right? At least in the first year, the messages were ubiquitous. We received daily press briefings. Uh, we heard regularly from public health officials. The media took seriously its duty to provide us with necessary information on a daily basis. Government leaders and the media listened to science and health experts. None of this consistency and coherence, however, is present with respect to the climate emergency. And when our governments don't act as if the situation is an emergency or worse, when they send contradictory messages by approving new fossil fuel infrastructure, they're effectively communicating to the public that it's not an emergency. And again, let me apply this marker to your university. Of course, as educators, seeking and telling the truth is your business, ain't it? But are your students and faculty hearing the climate truth from you in a manner that aligns with this, this historic moment? Are your students feeling supported when they strike for the climate? Are your faculty association and administration speaking up strongly to the provincial and federal governments on behalf of your students, demanding a real and convincing and compelling climate emergency plan? It strikes me that if a student was attending a university during World War II, everything about the experience told them that they were attending university at a time of emergency. Does it feel that way today? This is what educational institutions should be doing. And if your institution isn't, then increasingly in the coming few years, I predict the most visionary and engaged young people of this generation will choose to go somewhere else. I wanna share two other quick lessons from my study of World War II that are very relevant to the present. Lesson five, if you will, and it's a thread through the book, is that inequality is toxic to social solidarity and mass mobilization, and that real mobilization requires and means 
leaving no one behind. You know, there, there are some climate policy purists out there who say, don't connect the climate fight to, you know, inequality and tackling all these other social justice problems. You know, don't make it any more complicated. It's hard enough as it is. I think they're wrong. They're wrong, first of all, because these issues are inherently connected. The, the richer you are, the higher your emissions, the poorer you are, the more vulnerable you are to climate change. But we also need to link these issues because that's how we win. A successful mobilization requires that people make common cause across class and race and gender, and that the public have confidence that sacrifices are being made by the rich, as well as middle and modest income people. You know, during the First World War, inequality and rampant profiteering undermined such mobilization efforts that undermine recruitment. Consequently, at the outset of the Second World War, the King government took these bold steps to lessen inequality and limit excess profits. We saw new progressive taxes introduced. We saw Canada's first major income support programs introduced in the war. Unemployment insurance comes in the war. The family allowance comes in the war. This, this famous Marsh report that laid the groundwork for the whole post-war welfare system was written during the war and offered up to Canadians as a pledge and a promise that the country they would come back to would look different and be more just and more fair than the one they were leaving behind. That's when you saw the mobilization, right? That's when we start hitting the recruitment numbers. So the point in recalling all of this as we face today's threat and the need for mobilization is really twofold. First, to appreciate how inequality serves as a barrier to cross society mobilization. And second, to understand that effective mobilization isn't just about building more planes and tanks or today, wind turbines and solar panels. It requires policies that fulfill that promise that we will better look after one another, that we will guarantee good jobs and income supports and that people will be treated with dignity and fairness. When you're asking people to share in a great undertaking, that's how you keep everyone on the bus. And the last lesson I wanna mention is that indigenous leadership and rights and title are central to winning. And I wanna make this point by telling you the story of a World War II vet, a story I tell in the book. One morning as I was writing in 2019, a news item came across the radio about the death of Louis Levi Oaks, the last of the Mohawk code talkers from the community of Akwesasne. See, interestingly, it, just in the same way as it had been important to the Canadian government to independently declare war in 1939, separate from Britain, interestingly, the Iroquois Confederacy, of which the Mohawk are members, also independently declared war on Germany. Interesting, eh? Which resulted in many Mohawk men enlisting. Oaks died at the age of 94. The code talkers were indigenous soldiers tasked with using their own languages to communicate secret military information among the allied forces. In news reports after Oaks' death, his daughter revealed that astonishingly, Oaks hadn't told his family what he did during the war for seven decades, having been sworn to secrecy only in his late 80s, when stories of the code talkers were made more public, did he finally reveal what he'd done. Oaks was then awarded the Congressional Silver Medal and all special awards from the Assembly of First Nations and the Canadian House of Commons. He was one of 17 code talkers from Akwesasne, but there were hundreds of others from Indigenous nations across North America. See, as the war was unfolding, the, the secret codes employed by the Allies kept getting broken by the Nazi and Japanese forces. And then the US Marines discovered that enemy forces couldn't crack Navajo, Navajo. And then ultimately 33 indigenous languages were used by various branches of the allied forces, including a number from indigenous nations in Canada, like Mohawk, the Mohawk language in Cree and Tlingit and Ojibwe. But as I learned about this, it struck me that there is in this piece of wartime history, a tragic irony. See our two countries, Canada and the US had spent generations trying to erase indigenous languages from the earth, literally beating them out of children in residential schools, only to uncover that these languages were the unbreakable code. That's what they were dubbed in the war, credited as having been vital to victory in certain battles, particularly in the Pacific. And then fast forward to today. And the same can be said about indigenous rights and title, which similarly our two countries have spent generations systematically abusing and violating. And yet as our mainstream politics, dithers and dodges on meaningful and coherent climate action over and over and over again. It is the assertion of indigenous rights and title that is buying us time, slowing and blocking new fossil fuel projects until our larger politics comes into compliance with science. 
In fact, just a few months ago, in the Indigenous Environment Network and Oil Change International published a report where they, they tried to tally up all the GHGs that remained in the ground because of these indigenous led efforts to block fossil fuel projects. And they, they found it to be equivalent to about 25% of North American domestic emissions. My goodness and thank you. Final thought, like many of you, as I read the latest scientific warnings, I'm afraid. In particular, I feel deep anxiety about the state of the world we are leaving our kids and those who will live out through most of this century. All of us who take seriously these scientific realities wrestle with despair. That is the ambiguous time in which we live. The truth is, we don't know if we're going to win this fight, if we will rise to this challenge in time. But consider this. I mentioned before how from a population of 11 million Canadians, over 1 million enlisted and 64% of them under the age of 21. But it's worth appreciating that all of those people who rallied in the face of fascism 80 years ago, you know what they didn't know? They didn't know if they would win. It seems obvious to say it now, right? But we often forget that it was a good chunk of the war's early years during which the outcome was far from certain. We know how their story ended. They didn't. Yet that generation rallied regardless. And in the process, they surprised themselves by what they were capable of achieving, not just on the battlefront, but on the home front too. I think that's the spirit we need today. Thanks. I'm looking forward to some questions. Thank you, Seth. Seth, what a great insight into the landscape of our current climate crisis. So now I'd like to open up the floor for questions. I invite guests to use the Q&A button at the bottom there or to use the chat box feature. I'll try to monitor them with Bethany here. So the order will be selected randomly and we hope to answer all questions in the remaining time. I think one of the comments, maybe I'll just start off because I've got the floor here. Um, Seth was, you, you've, you've put down a menu or a blueprint that seems so simple. These four actions, do this, do this. And we have history to, to verify that these can work, but it does take concerted effort and it really does take speaking the truth, as you mentioned there. Do you see anywhere where in the world we're seeing any kind of government leadership that's really taking these four actions to some kind of fruition, shall we say? I know in Canada, we really, we struggle. We struggle to, to do more than just say it's an issue. But um, are, we, are we learning any from anywhere else? Mm, excellent, excellent question, Andy. Um, so first of all, you know, it's interesting. The polling tells us um, that it's really important to Canadians that we be leaders on climate. Um, and that's the good news. The bad news is it's also the case that uh, um, Canadians assume uh, that we are. <laughs> um, and we, I'm, I'm afraid we aren't. Um, uh, can you see that chart? Yep. Uh, those are GHG emissions for the G7 countries uh, going back to 1990. Uh, we are the worst. Every G7 country uh, beats us when it comes to reducing GHG emissions. Um, uh, Germany and the UK are interesting there. They, they've made the most progress. Uh, and a lot of it under conservative governments, by the way. You know, it, it, the climate hasn't been a political wedge issue uh, and weaponized the way it has uh, in the Canadian context, I'm afraid. So we have a lot of work to do. And there's many countries that are doing better than us. That said, I don't think there are, I can't point to another national government that I would say is hitting all four markers. I, I can point to other governments uh, uh, at, at, at uh, a lower level of government. In fact, uh, Andy, if I may, I'll, I'll share I'm a story in which I'm very biased. Um, Vancouver, where I live, has an actual climate emergency plan that hits these four markers. Um, now, I'm biased in this because my wife, is uh, Christine Boyle, is, the, is a Vancouver city councillor who, who moved the climate emergency motion here uh, three and a half years ago. Um, and, and from that motion, they, they created this uh, climate plan, which is, by most accounts, one of the most ambitious in North America. And 
it hits those markers because at the municipal level, it is certainly spending considerable resources in the capital budget on, on climate. Um, uh, they're creating new institutions. You know, we have a neighborhood energy utility and, and uh, that uh, has renewable energy and, and uh, uh, a number of things like that. Marker three is the key. More than 50% of greenhouse gas emissions in a typical city, including Vancouver, are from our buildings, from the combusting of gas, natural gas, so-called natural gas, methane gas in our buildings. Vancouver, as part of that plan said that as of the, this past January, like two months ago, no new buildings in Vancouver can use fossil fuels for space and water heating. And as of about 2025, the regulatory regime is now set so that even in existing older buildings, uh, uh, if your furnace or boiler goes, you won't be able to replace it with gas. At that point, you'll have to fuel swap to electric heat pump or something like that. Um, so uh, they're hitting the markers. Um, and uh, so it can be done, but it does take a willingness to be bold, to uh, grab a hold of what some in politics would typically view as a third rail and, and, uh, and just do it. Thanks, Seth. So I'm going I'm to read off some of these questions again. We're never going to get to them all, but uh, there are some wonderful questions here already. I also really liked how you, you've given us a few call to actions as a university to reflect honestly on what is Lakehead University and what more could Lakehead University be doing immediately and into the future and to build that into um, a desire from students to actually attend university here as well. So first question. Uh, most governments reacted quickly once the scale of the pandemic became clear. The impact of climate change became clear years ago. Little has been done. What will it take for governments to really recognize the climate change threat we face? Yeah. All of these comparisons I make between the war, the pandemic, climate, they're all imperfect, right? They have in common that they're all emergencies. The climate crisis, the curse of it really, compared to both the pandemic and the war, is that it moves in slower motion. Um, and also that when these events occur, these extreme events, they don't all occur everywhere uh, at the same time in the same place. So they fail to galvanize us in the same way. Um, and because it moves in slow motion, it allows for uh, politicians to kick the can down the road. And that has been our experience. Uh, that said, you know, I, I have no doubt that that moment is coming when we will be in emergency mode and our governments will be in emergency mode with us. The only question is, will it happen in time? Um, uh, but I'm convinced that it happen, will happen. And in the polling work I've done, because I, I commissioned uh, for my book research, I commissioned some original polling from Abacus data. Um, the good news out of that is that you see, um, you see really a population, a public ahead of our politics, both when it comes to seeing the emergency as an emergency and their preparedness to accept bold action. Um, the challenge, and this is where the role of an educational institute like you comes in, is that the, the basic level of climate literacy in Canada is very poor. And here I'm drawing upon the work of one of, one of your faculty, Ellen Field in, in the Faculty of Education, whose who's polling, the, the polling work that she and her team did point to the fact that really only about half the population correctly understand that the main source of global warming is the combusting of fossil fuels. So the public, I mean, that's a basic literacy problem. So you end up with these very confusing polling uh, results where when you say to the public, are, are we in an emergency? Yes. Should the government do, do more? Yes. Well, what should they do? And then the public jumps right to recycling and plastics because that's what we've been told for the last 30 years. Um, uh, and, and when you have that confusing public opinion polling, it allows, I think, our governments to make some mischief and to appear to be doing more than they're actually doing. 
Thanks, Seth. So next question, I think it also kind of relates a bit to the pandemic. So one of the major problems during the pandemic was the spread of misinformation slash disinformation that made things substantially worse. Oops, I, my question. I mean, look, um, we just the, sorry, finish it off. How can the same problem is happening with climate change? How can we tackle this to get the critical mass needed with the to the effect change? Yeah, the problem of, of misinformation is clearly a problem. And the fact that our media are so um, siloed, right, is a problem. Like the nice, what, thankfully, when Canada was at war, um, everyone had the same newscast, right? Everyone listened to CBC on the radio. They listened to Lauren Green uh, every night on the radio. And they were all listening to the same radio. And they were, if they were debating anything, at least they were debating... (laughs) on the same information and the same facts. We don't live in that world right now. And that does present a challenge. That said, let me go back to the polling results that I just shared, which is as challenging as the misinformation problem is, a vast majority of Canadians understand the threat of climate change and wanna see bold action. And the out and out, when you, when you poll on the question of sort of out and out climate denial, people who simply don't accept the reality of climate of human induced climate change. It is a diminishing rump of public opinion. It's about 7%. That's not our main problem. Our main problem is what I described in my talk, the new climate denialism, which are the political leaders who say they understand and accept the reality of human induced climate change, but don't practice a politics and a policy agenda that aligns with what that science uh, says uh, that we have to do. But again, it is incumbent on educational institutions and the media to, um, to provide that necessary information. But I wanna say one thing here, Andy, if I may, around a difference between pandemic and, and, uh, and the pandemic response and the reaction to it and the climate. And I want to say this in in light of, you know, the convoy we just witnessed and and the occupation of Ottawa. Clearly, there are thousands of people who who have this reaction against mandates, my marker number three. But here's the difference, you know. The, the, this has been a very hard two years. People often say to me, oh, Seth, you know, you know, look how much people tired, uh, you know, experience COVID fatigue in less than a year. And here I am saying to people, you know, we need to be in emergency mode for a few, a few years. Here's the difference. The things that we were called upon to do in this pandemic that, that elicited the reaction you just asked about are anathema to all of our social instincts. Stay home, isolate, be distant, wear a mask. No wonder people are exhausted of that. The good news about the climate emergency is that it calls on us and your students to do precisely the opposite, to get out and do something grand together. And I'm convinced we can do that for a few years. Here's a great question, uh, Seth. So a few years back, you mentioned a mentor of yours said the most insidious legacy of the 40 year period of neoliberalism is not the tax cuts or privatization, but it's the sapping of our imagination and our collective faith and capacity to do great things together. Can you expand on that and how that matters at this moment? Sure. Well, the person I was referencing was Alex Himmelfarb, who who served uh, for a few years as clerk of the Privy Council. Um, And, you know, first of all, what I'm delving into in that part of the book is the ways in which 40 years of neoliberalism have, are blocking our thinking, right? Why aren't we just spending what it takes to win? Why aren't we creating new crown corporations to get the job done? Why aren't we just using the regulatory power of the state to require change? And I think it's because these zombie neoliberal ideas uh, uh, that are embedded not just in conservatives' minds across the political spectrum, um, you know, preclude. They, they're like a straitjacket on our ability to think about what needs to be done. Although, interestingly, in this war, in the pandemic, 
in World War II, we see our leaders unshackled from these assumptions. Um, but this is where, I mean, Alex's point was that, that the most insidious legacy isn't the sort of straight up policy agenda of tax cuts and privatization and uh, deregulation, but the, that sapping of our imagination and our, our, our belief, our faith in our capacity to do great things together. But that's again why I think when you look at our response to the pandemic, there is something there to grab hold of, right? When you look at the level of government spending in the first year of the pandemic, really it, it lays bare that all, after all of these years of being told there's not enough money to fight climate or poverty or homelessness, it turns out that's not true. Um, when governments see emergencies as emergencies, the money is always there. Um, and that was my hope is that uh, the book, which was all written before the pandemic, would be this excavation, this reminder to restore our, our, our faith and imagination. Seth, do you foresee, this is a question here, do you foresee public awareness and expectations shifting to the point where leaders, government, organizations will be judged on their climate leadership? Or do you see the shift to be less education and value driven, more economically driven? Larry Fink, CEO of Blackwater, indicated the next 1,000 unicorn startup businesses worth at least a billion dollars will be involved in climate technologies. Uh, well, it's going to be a combination of all of those things, and they all play their role. But um, so first of all, uh, Blackwater's actions in recent years are contradictory, uh, just for the record, in terms of what they're saying versus what they're investing in and continuing to invest in. Um, that said, there's lots of fantastic things happening in the private sector. And I have enjoyed giving talks to private sector audiences, uh, particularly people who are you know, creating these, these clean tech and green uh, and low carbon technologies. And I'll tell you what I say to them. I say to them, uh, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for the technologies you're creating. We need them. But if you are hoping, uh, but, but, it's a, but it's a side hustle. If you hope that, we will achieve what we now need to achieve at speed and scale through the voluntary uh, development and introduction of what you are doing, we're fried. The thing that I admire about the business leaders in the Second World War is that they actually disabused their fellow business leaders of, the no of any notion that other than the fact that the speed and scale required had to be state-led. Um, uh, you know, when you look at, uh, let me give you one example from the war, an American example. Pearl Harbor happened in December of 1942, in 1941. In February of 1942, two months later, the last civilian automobile rolled off the assembly line in Detroit, and for the next four years, their production and sale was illegal. That didn't happen through the voluntary goodwill or patriotism of the big three automakers. It happened because they were ordered to convert and produce what needs to be done. My, my critique of the federal government right now, and they are gonna start bending the curve by the way, but not at the slope that's now urgently needed. When you look at their last federal budget, what they've offered to all these companies producing these low income, uh, these low uh, carbon technologies is a 50% corporate income tax cut. Now, some companies will take them up on that, but not at speed and scale. If you actually want to hit speed and scale, the government has to spend what it takes to win. And when necessary, like C.D. Howe did, create the crown enterprises to just do it. Well, we're almost coming to the end here, Seth. I'm going to ask you one last question. Um, and it kind of relates very much to our, our year, uh, Yoka here. Um, as you know, Seth, we've been coordinating a year of climate action, or YOKA, here at Lakehead. YOKA has been an important, first, important, an important first step, but there are many more steps to take. Our university community would just be discussing priorities for next steps in relation to climate action in the final YOKA symposium in May. So the question here is, 
Are there other institutions of higher education that you see as leading the way in terms of bold and radical climate action or responding to climate change as an emergency that can inspire our Lakehead community as we envision our next steps? Hmm. Um, look, I think you're on the right path. And the fact that you've joined with a, a, a select number of other post-secondary institutions in divesting is terrific, divesting from fossil fuels. Um, there are probably a few institutions that are a little ahead of you in terms of creating um, uh, climate uh, programs where young people can actually spend a few years really focused on this particular file. But the truth of the matter is mo most universities or many of them are in the same place as you are. A number of them have passed climate emergency motions or declarations uh, at their board of governors, uh, pressured by their student activists to do so for the most part. And now they're all like you, I suspect, uh, stuck in this place of trying to figure out, okay, we passed the motion. Now, what the heck does that mean in practice? Um, and so that's where I've tried to, um, I invite you to use the four markers as a framework for thinking through, having said it, what does emergency practically, concretely now mean uh, for our institution. Um, I think that's the best I can offer you. And, and as we're closing, let me just say this too. Um, uh, you know, the next few years are gonna make it or break it for us and your, all of your students. Uh, this is it, we're at the crossroads moment. We're all gonna have to decide as, as people and as institutional leaders like you are, uh, what kind of people we want to be again. Um, I did share in the chat uh, a link to uh, the Climate Emergency Unit. I invite people to get on our newsletter list because then you can stay uh, appraised of the campaigns that we're launching, including in Ontario. Um, uh, but I think I've given you a good menu. Um, I, I hope you engage your member of parliament who uh, holds the seat C.D. Howe did. Um, and, and is now the Minister for Indigenous Services, which have, has a key role to play in that climate emergency agenda. Um, we need your voice uh, uh, saying no to new fossil fuel infrastructure projects and those debates are in play, whether it's Trans Mountain or the Bay Denal project off Newfoundland. Um, you have an election coming up uh, in, in, in June in your province. Like there are many concrete things that both as an institution and those of you as faculty and students uh, can do. Um, can I close with this, Andy? Do I have a moment just to close with a final thought? Of course. Um, I'll come back like your weird uncle to my World War II story, okay? Um, it strikes me, there's a whole resurgence in this interest in World War II studies. So you only have to do is look at your Netflix stream or any bookstore shelf to see like how much World War II stuff is out there, uh, which is fascinating to me. Why is that? I think, you know, for anyone who has an interest in grand historic moments like that, um, like many of your students do, many of your faculty do, you know, when you turn off the Netflix show at night or close the book cover, I think there's a question in your head. And it is, what would I have done if I had lived then and there? But here's the thing. The answer to that question is not really a mystery because a civilizational threat is again at our doorstep. And the future of your kids and grandkids and students is again cast into doubt. Um, so the answer to that question, what would I have done then and there, is whatever we're each ready to do now. Well, thank you so much, Seth. And I, and I apologize to all the people who've put questions into the Q&A or in the chat. You know, it's, it's time is always the, the, the enemy of us. And um, I'm really glad, Seth, that, of course, you, you, you're using the words emergency and crisis. These really are times when it becomes an emergency and crisis. I always have to say it's been a pleasure, but it appears we've concluded our keynote talk with Seth Klein. I remind everyone again to visit uh, sethkline.ca backslash book in order to your own copy and a reminder to use the game code hashtag SethK to earn points toward prizes. Again, Seth, I, I thank you and I wish you continued success. I look forward to seeing everyone at more talks, panels, and competitions. 
and also suggest that you visit the launch of the first Ignite research video in your sessions listed at 1 p.m. So have a great day and welcome to Research and Innovation Week, a week that is truly great for Lakehead University and moment for real celebrations. Thank you again, Seth.